your competition right now for the average guy who's watching this who jacks off five times a week and he plays video games for like one hour a day but it's more like four the thing is if you do a push-up today you have literally beaten 500 million men how can that not blow your mind and if you go and do like a good structured program you're beating pretty much every single guy i think that the dating youtube space at the moment is totally fascinating and it's fragmenting into loads of little subgroups at the moment. How would you categorize the content that you make? What's the purpose of the stuff that you put out on YouTube? I'd say holistic self-improvement. I love that term more than like, I've, I've taken a bit from everywhere, right? And I've done the full like hardcore red pill type of stuff. I've ventured into the black pill so other people don't have to go and look at their content. But I found that there's, there's never really like a healthy mix between them. A lot of them will just focus like just solely on women, seeing them as the enemy, trying to be sexist towards them or aggressive towards them. A lot of them just focus on like nihilism and like this sense of like hopelessness. And I don't think any one pill or space online really combines anything together to give like a younger man the the framework for like a healthy life going forward, revolving around good relationships. And I love the term holistic self-improvement, which is just, okay, let's, why not? Why don't we all just improve as much as we can? So of course we'll try and up our SMV. We'll try and like attract more women and everything, but why not do that alongside things like healthy mental health practices, gratitude, mindfulness, learning things about like our childhood trauma and how that shapes our dating life. You're right. There's no one pill that's got all of the answers within it. And you can learn bits by bouncing between them, but it seems mm. like the, the most toxic communities are the ones where someone's got into it and then never, ever left. Oh, that was me in the red pill for like seven years. You can, like, I think you've, you've taken it as well. Like, you can really, really go deep inside one of these. And when you stop questioning the reliability, the accuracy of what, like, you know, the information that you consume, you can so you can put like such a hindrance on your growth well that's how cults work that is yeah. precisely how cults work that you have this leader the leader's word cannot be questioned all of the followers that get co-opted in they all just believe because you're supposed to believe and nobody questions anybody's words and that lack of critical thinking causes it. think about what cults do they wrap people around it's a geographical location but also an ideological location they don't permit them to grow have you seen my instagram bio no, what's it say? I've just changed as a cult leader. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that's why you know what I'm on about. Well, I did some research on like cults and religions, and I wanted to create like the first healthy cult where you actually like voluntarily come in. I, I voluntarily like tell you, yeah, you're joining a cult. We're a cult of young men who don't faff anymore, and like who is trying to like reduce our drug usage. <laughs> Talk to me about no faff. I, I think the online space has got this like different perception of what it is in my opinion i think a lot of people think like it is you know oh, the, the levitation and it's going to make you amazing and everything and it, you certainly will see a very very significant change in your life if you're one of those like hardcore wankers who like who are going multiple times a day messed up porn and everything which to be honest like there's a fair amount of guys and i i have the authenticity to say yeah 100 i was not not that messed up but like i was one of those guys right and so when you go from this like multiple times a day to like not maybe let's say once every three days you're, you're masturbating there's quite a big difference and that's like i think as far as a lot of the benefit does go after that there's like this again this cult online which is telling you okay if you if you ever touch a dick again like that's that's the perception that they're pushing on to young young men if you fap again you've lost the benefits which that that blows my mind because that's so unhealthy to tell young guys it's like telling an obese guy okay yeah get into get into the gym get into the gym you should go every day if you miss a day you lose all of the progress that's that's heartless man that's so like I've come across more young men who have been pained by nofap than who have just like got problems with like really? porn and masturbation. Yeah, because they get like this, this um, existential crisis where now they feel like more of a loser because they keep failing nofap. And it's just like simple habit science. I tell, I, I always ask them the question like, when when did you start jacking off? And they'll say, you know, age thirteen. Then they're nineteen right now. So six years you've been building up this habit. You found NoFap a few weeks ago. Six years you've been building it up and you just think you're going to break the habit just like that. 
it's like at least for me it, it took me about five years to get onto like no fap where like i just it's it honestly like it's not in my life at all I, I don't even think about it i often forget that porn and masturbation is the thing but i was so hard on myself for the first like year or so thinking like i should get to day 90 or something because it's not just about like you know the discipline and willpower it's about bro like we've been building up this habit for like 10 years man it's like it's gonna take some time to like produce it down i wonder how many people would benefit from no fap that aren't like pathological fappers the people who aren't completely addicted and see it as a vice because one of the things that i've realized recently is that with a lot of the things we do that we don't like ourselves for doing let's say it's using our phone too much or maybe it's junk eating on a night time or whatever it might be i would say that less than 50 percent of the problem is the actual activity that you do and most of the problem comes from the story that you tell yourself about the type of person you are for having done that action so a lot of the benefits that I think we get from going through any type of personal development actually comes from a reframing around capturing our own agency to do with that particular action. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, very, very well said. That's like, it's like this bell curve where at first you don't really think that the original thing is the problem, the vice is the problem, so masturbation or let's say the junk food. Eventually you start to see people talk about, you know, quitting it and everything. Like this is when you hate the thing. You hate the thing, but you can't stop it. And so there's often this negative mental well-being stage when you're trying to start a new thing which everyone kind of knows which is like when you finally start thinking okay i've got to go to the gym i've got to lose weight i've got to do this it's like you just feel like shit for a little while because you hate the thing but you still have a habit or even an addiction to the thing and you've actually brought up like a fantastic point recently i've been thinking that potentially the best way to actually improve things like this, whether it's no fap or healthy eating, it's actually way more about the self image and like the beliefs that we have about ourselves more than it actually is. You know, like the stereotypical advice of like, oh, like, you know, install the website blocker and like don't buy the junk food and everything. Because if you just kind of like hide the stuff away from you, like it's like a child just saying, like, oh, I can't, I can't see the porn anymore, so I can't be addicted. Or like, you know, I didn't buy the junk food, so I can't eat it anymore. But it's, it's more, if me, you, me and you have a chocolate bar in front of us right now, we're probably not going to eat it because it's just it doesn't really align with our identity. We're going to think, oh, it's just not. I don't want to put it onto my fitness pal and just have the regret there. Like, oh yeah, four hundred calories for speak a month. For you, Bro. Speak for yourself, man. I'm not, I'm not tracking at the moment. I can eat whatever the fuck I want. So I had, oh, um, man. I had Charlie Hooper from Charisma on Command on the show <clears throat> earlier this week, and uh, we were talking about the fact that there is a tension between assisting yourself to not do the things that you don't want to do by hiding them away from you or by creating constraints in your life so you don't want to play league of legends so you snap the game in half and delete your xbox account or whatever and there is a question look i know that you're not a gamer because you just said that <laughs> any gamers who's listening to you right now is like <laughs> what is it pc only <laughs> Fuck. snap the game in half. In half yeah snap your pc in half um, <laughs> um the problem that you have is that there is a part of you that feels defeated by that. Like, oh, I'm defeatist because I've assisted. So the same as you saying like, look, is keeping the junk food out of the house actually putting a blinker over your eyes so that you can't deal with the underlying problem that's causing the junk eating in the first place? I would be tempted to say that you need to give yourself assistance in the first place. Like environment design is a huge part of habit building. And it's probably the case that the tools you get in the beginning that get you across the first river isn't the boat that you're supposed to carry across land to get you across the second river. It's like, look, the thing that you did that got you here isn't the thing that's going to get you there. So if you decide to assist yourself by putting a, a pawn blocker on your laptop or getting rid of all of the junk food out of your house or doing whatever it might be, that's fine. And then that will allow you to at least gain some mm. momentum when your ability to stick to the habit is its weakest. Then we start to build up, we start to build up. Okay, now I've got a bit more capacity. I've got a bit more capacity and now maybe I can look to reintroduce looking at where does my compulsion to eat junk food on an evening come from? Oh, it's actually because I'm bored because I don't have anything to do. Maybe it's because I'm lonely. Oh, well, now that I've given myself room away from the junk food, I can actually start to fill that with something else. That's a really, really good point, actually, yeah. So the original uh, environmental design, I often critique it. I often say, even though every like scientist disagrees with me and they say, you know, like, willpower is limited, I'm like, I feel like I'm the one guy right now telling everyone rely on willpower instead. Because at least, like in my story, like the environmental design would never even work. Because it's this idea, okay, I can not buy the junk food inside the store, 
but then we've we've already got some at home. I can okay, I'll throw it all out. I'll, you know, it's one of the I'm going on a diet. I'm going to throw out the junk food. But then like my girlfriend's going to come back home with like extra food, or I go to to work and it's like it's a customer service job at the time. So like motherfuckers are bringing in like a lot of snacks and stuff. So I'm eating that. So it's like if the idea is like you're going to say no once inside of the shop. The thing is, if if all you have is the environmental design, you you probably aren't going to manage the entire environment around you. Whereas it really is that level of willpower and even like the self image, the belief that any given time like we we have junk food in the house all the time my family loves that shit but like i walk past the kitchen no problem every like every single day for like two years there's the stuff that i used to binge eat on but the reason why is because i always try to do this thing of like no no you know don't go into the kitchen like tell my dad not to buy the crisp eventually i, I, I just it's kind of like psychopathic but i got my favorite snacks just set them on the desk and just looked at them and i don't think many people have done this but like oh did the weird thoughts that you get about yourself when you do that like seriously get the best snacks that you've ever gotten even drugs as well so i did this with weed and i just put it on top of the table just with a, like a notepad so i journaling and it just makes you feel like a crackhead because you're like oh like you know like okay so the, the experiment writing, so like... writing a fucking ode to my drugs i've got it i've written a poem i'm outside of its window with a pair of roses <laughs> the boom box in it <laughs> 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 Talk to me. So you've mentioned there about this sort of um, chasm of difficulty. You've got self-development de depression is something that you talk about. What's that? Mm, that's one of the first stages. It's like essentially, let's say you're a normal person. You just kind of, all you know about self-improvement is like, oh yeah, like go to the gym. But eventually you find the space online. You start finding the books of self-help and everything. Some people seem to get stuck in level one. And I think that a fair amount of like healthy people seem to breeze past this stage. So the healthy people that I've, for example, I've spoke to, I've coached, they'll find out about meditation, no fat, whatever, and they'll implement it fairly straightforward. Exercise, I'll tell them, okay, yeah, start exercising few, almost every single day. They'll, they'll do it, no problem. There's so many people who, because, it's only because of mental health that they're stuck in stage one, which is that they know what they should be doing. They just can't seem to do it. So for these people, for example, they would have had an idea, let's say, nice and simple to exercise, and they'll be like, oh yeah, like, you know, today's the day I'm going to exercise, right? You know, it feels really relevant. And then they'll look back and be like, wait, it's been three weeks since I watched that motivational video and I said I was going to exercise again. They just, they fall straight into the same pat patterns. We could grab this person, take them inside the gym with us, make them do the best workout of their lives. And they're so hyped and everything. Like, you know, they're making some gains. They're not going to come again for like the next month. And it's this self-improvement depression because they are now in the space of hearing about people like me and even you yourself who have made progress and we're talking about you know the fantastic like stuff that comes from this and everything and they don't get to enjoy that they just can't seem to get consistent in any of the habits they can't seem to like make meditation work for them they you know it doesn't work and everything they've tried so many times and it's a very very depressing and like scary place to be because you feel quite vulnerable and like you no longer are satisfied and oblivious to your old life of, you know, video games and porn and everything. But now you know the dangers of them. You've watched the videos, this, you know, oh, like, I used to play video games, but now I don't play video games. And look at me, everyone, I've got, I've got girls now. And like, some little guys watching that thinking like, wait, but I want girls, but like, I can't, you know, he can't, he can't um, snap his League of Legends disc in half as you would say. Yeah, exactly. Exactly what he needs to do. <laughs> are you familiar with Plato's Allegory of the Cave? Do you know that story? No. Okay, so uh, Plato gives this story about um, three men that are chained up inside of a cave and they're looking at a wall. In oh, the shadows. Yeah, the shadows on the wall, right? And then one of them gets freed. He goes out into the world. He suffers pain. He can't see because it's so bright and he's been in the darkness. And then eventually after looking at the reflection of the world in the water and then finally the world in its full color, he starts to see that, oh, wow, the previous world that I thought this was all that existed is only a mere shadow of what is available for us. And he comes back in to the cave and then he looks at his friends. He's stumbling around. He can't see because he's now in darkness. He's back. He's regressed back to the previous version of himself to try and communicate between where he is and where the people that he wants to bring up with him is. And he says to them, look, guys, like th this isn't the real world. I promise you out there, there is something better. It's more blissful. It's fuller. And they're not happy. They said, look, you, you can't even see in here anymore. You can't see inside of the cave. This was supposed to be the place that you knew. And he can't see because he's seen what is true. He comes back. He's ostracized by the people that live at a lower resolution than him. And the argument from Plato is, look, this is the job of a philosopher. It's to try and peer through. It's to see what the truth is. And it's to then try and tell people who need to be leveled up from that. But there is a pain associated with that. If, the, if true hell is when the person that you are meets the person that you could have been, Every time that you get to see the person that you could be continue to ri rise up 
and you see that through YouTube videos with people that are doing things and crushing it and killing it and Instagram and models and blah, blah. Every time that you see that, the ceiling of potential continues to move away and you need to try and catch up with it now. So you just continue to feel this chasm between where you are and where you could be. Wow, and that's got to be painful. It kind of reminds me of the analogy of the crabs in a bucket mentality. So that's very common in self-improvement, where the, one of the guys in the friendship group will find self-improvement, start working on himself, and find that no one else seems to want to like climb up in the same way. And it's, 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 it just blows your mind because you want to go to your friend and say, look, look boys, like I've, I've been lifting some weights and I finally feel confident. You know, we're all nerds and stuff. But like, look at me, I've got some biceps and stuff. And they'll make fun of you. They're like, no, like we don't do that type of stuff here. Oh, that's here. fucking gay. Why yeah. You do oh, that? like you're going to the gym. That's gay. Like, come on, man. That's the worst thing. Dude, this is my least favorite thing about British, <clears throat> British culture. My least favorite thing by far. Like mm. that tall poppy syndrome is holding so many young people back that could be amazing that have got desires for growth, that want to go and do something different, but are terrified because every time they try to do something different, their immediate social circle takes the piss out of them. What's that, that tall poppy syndrome? Yeah, so you can imagine that you look in a field and there's a field of poppies and there's a tall one. As you go through, which one are you going to chop down? The most likely oh, one that you're going yeah. to chop down is the tall poppy. It's called tall poppy syndrome. I don't know the full history of it. I think it's an Australian term originally, but yeah. Tall poppy syndrome. Something sticks out. Something grows faster than everything else. That's the one that gets chopped. So which one would you rather be? Like amongst the masses and just kind of seeing the same thing as everyone else or the one up here who kind of like Dude. lives fast, dies young? Dude, that's a good question. That's a genuinely good question. So when I, the first ever time that I saw Jordan Peterson live, someone said to him, the depth of my consciousness causes me to suffer. Is it a blessing or a curse to feel everything so deeply? I'm like, this is a really fucking smart question because a lot of the people that are in the audience, they've maybe started to step out of Plato's cave. They've started to look around and go, look, fuck, maybe, maybe there is more to life. But by taking that decision, you are inevitably going to suffer as well. And Jordan said, basically, you, the only solution would be to regress back to a lower state of consciousness, right? To go into some lower resolution version of the world. And a lot of people escape from their insights with drugs, with alcohol, with sex, with extreme sports. Sometimes people even take their own lives in an effort to try and get away from this because they don't feel like they can find a solution. And he said, look, it's too bloody late to regress back. What you need to do is take more of the thing that poisons you until you turn it into a tonic that girdles the world around you. He's like, you have not less consciousness, but more. You go deeper, you go further in. And I'm watching this thing and my hairs, even now, man, reciting it, the hairs stand up on the back of my neck. I'm like, that is so correct. You need to go deeper. You need to take more of the thing that you think is the challenge and you turn it into a tonic that girdles the world around you. Mm. That's making me think of like the beginner who starts in the gym and the first workout just absolutely kills them. They're like, oh my gosh, you know, how do people do this? It's like, my, my, my muscles are so sore. And if they stop right now, or it, even in any sport, like kickboxing reminds me of this, if they stop right now, every single time they try to get back into the gym, they will feel the same pain or even worse than normal. And it's so interesting that the more you go, the less pain that you'll actually feel till eventually the pain actually becomes the pleasure. Like it's like we actually like, like if my chest doesn't get sore, I'm like, oh, like, I guess I'm a little bitch. I guess I didn't even, yeah, I didn't even hit that shit. <laughs> now I'm like, oh, like, oh my God, yes, boys. Like I'm, I'm finally feeling chest dumps. Whereas before, when you get them, <laughs> It, our perception of pain, especially in, in in positive habits, is so so skewed when you are at like when you're currently in Plato's uh, cave. Because I'm I'm guessing the the first character as he walked outside, his eyes is burning and everything. He can't but eventually, see he starts to see. Yeah. yeah, and the first thing that he sees, he looks at the world through the reflection of a lake. So he walks and walks and walks until he hits a lake, and then he doesn't see the world first. The first thing that he actually sees is a reflection of the world, right? Which is kind of like the way that shadows work. So he sees a lower resolution of a higher resolution mm. thing. And then eventually as his eyes finally begin to adjust, he's able to look around and see the sky and the trees and the birds and the grass. Um, so here's a, a fucking cool story. There's a place in Austin called Kuya, which is a uh, ketamine psychotherapy, NAD, IV, vitamin IV recovery center that has sauna and cold bath. And you do what's called contrast therapy. So you go into a sauna that goes up to 230 degrees. And then you get into a cold tub, a single cold tub up to your neck. 
hands, wrists, full works, and it's just above freezing. It's like three, three to six degrees Celsius. Um, and when you're in the cold tub, it's a very unique kind of pain because there's nothing to distract yourself. You know, when you're doing a workout, the pain is relative to the effort that you're putting in. This is completely passive pain. It's simply because you're sitting there and it's short. You're only in there for three minutes, three or four minutes, right? But if you can sit and just think about the sensation that you're feeling when you sit in the cold water, it stops being pain. It stops even being cold. It's no longer cold. It's this bizarre electric sort of like, it, it feels like lemon. It feels it, it, like all of these things that kind of wrap around the sensation that have fuck all to do with cold electricity and citrus and shit and dude it's the best mindfulness exercise just sitting in there and feeling your own compulsion to want to get out to breathe to feel pain to feel pleasure it's wild i was gonna say as you were telling me that story that's just sounds like pure mindfulness training there like as in cold showers if you try and fight the pain fight the cold off it's so much worse but it's so weird that if you submit yourself to the cold if you allow it suddenly like it's not as it's, it's the same with exercise and everything that we do the pain only is suffering if you fight it but if yeah. you allow it like the, the pain actually just becomes that pleasure that's what surrender is that's fully what surrender is so the first time that i went i went with my buddy zach big youtuber uh and we got in and we were both fine then he got his got in his own head about being in the cold and a couple of times he got out early and then the next time that we went we got in the cold thing and he's and I'm thinking, oh, you're not going to last 25 seconds. And he got out because he was in his own head. And then eventually after a couple of more sessions, he breaks that and then he's back in. Nothing's changed. His physiology hasn't changed at all, but his relationship to surrendering to the thing that he's supposed to do. And this is coming back to what we said before, right? About framing what your habits mean to you. You're getting in the cold tub. Look, is this an opportunity for you to do something which is going to make you feel amazing, which is a fascinating mm. experience and a, a deep dive into your own motivations inside of your brain for three minutes that feels like 30? Or is it you battling the cold? Is it you versus this thing and I better breathe because if I don't breathe and I'm all tense? No, nah, man. There's a cue that I got from one of the guys I was training with and he said, what would this be like if it was easier? And it's such a dope cue. Like, what would this thing that I'm doing be like if it was easier? And it was, we were in a plank and that was when he said it to me. It's like, hey man, like, just remember, like, what would this be like if it was easier? And you find yourself actually easing into the movement and feeling stronger because you're not tense everywhere. You're tense where you need to be. So it's such a fucking good insight. Mm, I really like that. I read it in um, Greg McEwen's second book, Effortless. Effortless, yep. Yeah, I really love that concept. That, that comes up in so many, like every habit I can think of right now, I found that if you think it's going to be difficult, like the, the story you tell yourself, it's going to be difficult. Making YouTube it's, videos every day. Absolutely. Like it's easy now. And because of that, it is easy. Because I think it's easy and it's fun, it's going to be easy and fun. Whereas if, for example, before this call, I thought, yeah, it's going to be a fun conversation with Chris. And that's exactly what it feels like. But if I could have been tense, like, oh my God, this guy, he's, he's, he's got 200 followers. He's got like 200K followers. He's got a nice jawline and everything. I'm going to get anxious. <laughs> 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 then it would have felt very like tense. And it, it just whatever frame of mind you put yourself in, it seems like the world just reacts in that way for you. Yeah. Dude, I want to talk about Britney Spears. We need, we the... simply have to talk about this. So for the people that haven't seen, uh, one day ago, Britney Spears posted a two-photo carousel on her Instagram with the caption, free woman energy has never felt better. And she is completely naked, apart from a long pair of white socks. And she has an emoji of a heart over her vagina and a flower over her nipple. Uh, and then there's another photo, if you swipe right, there is another photo where she's kind of like wide-legged uh, and the, with the same, the same emoji set up. So you can go and see this. And it's got nearly 3 million likes, but perhaps unsurprisingly, she turned comments off. Um, what's your, what are your thoughts on that, Hamza? 
So there's a YouTuber called Alexander Grace. I sent you the, uh, the link to his YouTube video. He was saying uh, polygamy is going to yep, be the new normal. I watched normal. that one. And um, he, he said it in like a fantastic way where he said, imagine if the real feminists of the 1900s saw what was happening today. Like they would they would think that you were lying. If we told them, oh yeah, by the way, like women are fighting to be more sexualized than ever to like, to for free post pictures of themselves so that millions of, tens of millions of people can see it. The real feminists of the 1900s would would think that you were joking they would think that you were just like mocking them that this is like it's the sad state where now i especially think of like the young women and the teenagers who who are kind of seeing like their idols post this and obviously we model after the people that we look up to and it's kind of like okay so in this bizarre counterintuitive way the modern sort of feminist narrative has encourages women more than ever to show off their bodies to be promiscuous which is kind of like the counterintuitive aim of the 1900s movements. Certainly not a linear progression between the yeah. two. Dude, the thing that I fucking think, we need to all apologize to a dad and say, look, dad, maybe you were right. Do you see that court case? Do you see where he was basically, oh, right, okay. So the story seems like Britney Spears' dad had control over her entire life, like, she her, her estate which included her back catalog of records um i think it was like even to do with her finances how she could spend money it was it was pretty severe right and it seemed a bit sinister as well especially the way it was portrayed in the press i don't know the ins and outs of the court case but it didn't seem fantastic but also britney's had some um challenges mentally in the past which i think was what had legitimated that in the first place so anyway there was this big back and forth and it was hashtag free Britney was going on for ages, mm. right? They wanted to give her her life back. And I don't know what the current situation of that is. I feel like she might have got more of her liberty back from her father. But you think, Britney, if this is the first thing that you do after getting, if you post a fully naked selfie twice on Instagram to prove your own sanity and the fact that you don't need your father, I'm like, I, I don't know if we were right. I don't know if we were right. Save Britney. Maybe save Britney, not free Britney. I think, to be honest, you and I are looking at this from quite a level-headed perspective, which isn't really the general consensus of the modern world around us. Whereas, okay, so we're looking at this in like a quite critical way, but I think the overwhelming majority of people will see this as a positive act for like feminism and for the act of um, expressing a sexuality. They'll see like this is a confident thing, like a brave thing to do. I'm so maybe I have too much faith in humanity, but but people can let us know in the comments, right? If you think that w what your opinion of this is, whether Brittany is um, liberating herself and experimenting with the sovereignty of her own body and her own social media platform, or if this is somebody that could do with a bit of help and needs a phone call from a friend, like it doesn't seem to me. I, I would be interested to speak to the person that says like, "Go, Brittany!" After that. Um, and it just seems like a bad PR move as well. Th you've just come out of a court case where your dad had control of everything because he was worried that you were going to lose your head. And then you... <sighs> I don't know. For some people, there's no such thing as bad PR, though. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, Britney's... Come on, Britney. It's been a while. How long was, like, her first single? 20, probably 25 years ago? Or some shit? But that's another interesting thing. We were talking about this offline. Um what happens when you very quickly gain status and think about child stars. Um, and this is, f here's an interesting one for you, man. Britney Spears, Macaulay Culkin and Brett Weinstein, Eric Weinstein, Jordan Peterson, people at kind of the opposite ends of life and maturity, but both of which can be just gifted global renown immediately. How the fuck are you supposed to deal with that status? Like the mm. human brain was not meant to be able to receive international acclaim and be known by millions and millions of people like, like that. Honestly, that's why you see so many of these like child celebrities with mental breakdowns. Like it used to be in a quite a horrifying way. It used to be quite a, kind of funny to the general population. I think either it was Britney Spears or Madonna or something like trimmed their head off, their, their hair off and everyone was laughing about it and everything. But it's only now as more like, as we were saying, like normal people are starting to get f fame and, you know, w you and I are branching into like the dark territory where we're like somewhat normal, somewhat not. And like, we can start to see, like, we haven't spoke about this, but we, 
you must get some kind of like hate comments every now and then and it, it does like mess you up sometimes because we haven't even fathomed the power of the internet yet and when you do read a comment it, it's in my belief that it feels exactly like a person in front of you saying that and when we do get like a critical comment from someone it's this evolutionary thing inside of us that like kicks up you know puts us into fight or flight thinking okay if you don't act right you'll be kicked out of the tribe imagine that with 10 people that's scary imagine that with 100 well that's life-threatening now imagine it with like literally a million people no wonder these like these guys are like literally taking naked pictures of themselves so like hopefully they get some likes or like yeah i I would love to know the the motivation behind that vid that uh photo so fucking interesting but you are right like people remember the insults and forget the blessings that negativity bias is a hell of a drug and it's everywhere but i don't know les would not be swayed by that les would be completely fine and he would just (laughs) Get get stuck into what he's got to do next. All right, so give me give me your thoughts on Red Pill YouTube. Yeah, um, it's mixed because a fair amount of people, and somewhat including myself, have found some value in them. And it's there is absolutely value in having like older men give you wisdom, and you know they'll record videos and they'll say, for example, like don't pedestalize women; they're just normal people and everything. The issue is that, that those type of videos don't really do well on YouTube. What does better is like, okay, we hate women now and treat them like garbage and here's how to like fuck them and like, you know, th- throw them out and everything. Here's like how to do like degenerate type of stuff. And the issue now is the internet's very, very nuanced. And so any kind of like red pill YouTuber that you're going to come across is usually on this side of quite like quite a degenerate, negative, hateful, hostile personality. And I, I've certainly like, I'm not even exempt from this. I've certainly branched into this multiple times. Um, the issue is that what does best for views and for likes and for growth on YouTube, which is an admirable, you know, it's a a business at the end of the day is how people make a living. That isn't what, what is best for a young man's mind. So the red pill YouTubers who are very popular right now are almost entirely just a negative influence. In my opinion, they do teach some things. So for example, a young man who's, who stumbled onto the red pill YouTubers will, for example, learn something which will help him with the next girl he speaks to. But the issue with that is that by emulating the red pill YouTubers that he sees, the only girls that he can attract are similar to the girls that that red pill YouTuber are attracting. And the red pill YouTuber, if he says all women are hoes and then he's teaching you, oh yeah, like here's, here's how to text girls. Well, he's, te- he's telling you how to text hoes. So now the young man who's following that advice, any good, healthy woman is not going to be attracted to the way he'd like to text for in this example. Only the hoes are going to be attracted to it. So it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy. And like people said this to me multiple times as I was going through my red pill journey myself, but I couldn't really understand it. You know, they're the blue pillars. We can't trust them and everything. Up until you really do like take a huge step back and you realize like you've just pigeonholed yourself to attract the women that you actually do hate. Dude. Oh, I mean, think about, here's a good example. Think about the girls that Fresh and Fit invite round. Like, they purposefully go out of their way to find the thottiest, most ratchet, degenerate girls that they can from the streets of Miami, and they invite them round, and they have some drinks, and then they use it as their opportunity to outwit the only other people in Miami that they can, <laughs> who are these club, <laughs> nightclub girls, and then use that to... Like their intellect stands on the shoulders of girls that are five tequilas deep. And I'm, oh my God. <laughs> dude, I'm fucking adamant. I'm fucking adamant that the fact that Fresh from Fresh and Fit is seen as an alpha male by some corners of the internet, I'm fucking certain that that is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Like that is the biggest, forget COVID, forget Trump, forget January 6th. The fact that that man is seen as an alpha is the worst comment on culture in the modern era that I could give. Which one is fresh? He's the one that always sounds like he's got food in his mouth. (laughs) Oh my God. Permanently sounds like he's got food in his mouth. He just got rumbled. He just got rumbled for being on a seeking arrangement. So he has this chick on the channel and he invites around and they start talking about how I know that she's different. She's this sort of a girl. She meets him at this boat party. Then everybody finds that she's got this TikTok account where she says the only type of guys that she likes and then just switches to a photo of a, a bucket load of cash. She's got a channel on seeking arrangements and it's like luxury lifestyle, fitness lifestyle, exclusive parties. And it turns out that that's how he met her. 
he's got this weird story about how he was at a party in Miami with this basketballer and then this basketballer said, oh, I fucked that girl as well on your Instagram. Hey, why don't you come back to my, where's the good parties tonight? And then Fresh ends up taking him around and ends up having like sex with five girls in one night or something. You're like, dude, this is like Jay from the Inbetweeners. This <laughs> legitimately sounds like, so I had one over there and I was fucking her with my toe. And you think, oh my God, what the fuck is wrong with these people? Yeah, I'm not going to lie, man. My first perception of them, once, like I saw like a, quite a lot of like clickbaity content and, you know, there's just girls ass and thumbnail and everything. And it, it, it is definitely entertaining to watch because it is just like kind of degenerate shit that, you, you know, you, like I don't want the door to open. Like, I don't want my mum to walk in. I'd rather just switch porn on. It's easy to explain. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's just, the issue is, right, with, with stuff like that, again, it's it's inherently just negative media. There's no, I, So people reply and, you know, they say like, oh, no, but it's really, really helped me. But it's like, I don't think it would have. I think any realised or insights that you really got from at least the the show that they do with the girls it's just kind of like you need to watch one episode or just read Roller to Massey's shit. books it's just exactly like, oh like oh like women are 70% it's like they, they just reply in the exact same thing they've just got different girls and it's just like young men are consuming it just as an addiction to like their YouTube like you know content consumption I will go to say though that they're they do shows with like other guys. So they've done shows with like Roller Tomasi, Jay Waller and, and um, Sterling Cooper. And those ones, like, it's, it's so different. Like I, I wish they did more because they're actually given some like great wisdom and it, it was a totally different vibe where they're thinking of like the young man and they think, okay, oh, guys, you should like focus on your credit score and everything. And it's like, that's some like good ass advice right there. But the issue is like, that doesn't sell. Those ones will get a lot less views. Just that's the ass difference, on the, man. Ass on the it, thumbnail, that's what we want to see. We like, kick these hoes out. Like, that's what everybody oh, yeah. wants. It's a, it's a drama channel. Someone said, what was it? It's Jerry Springer for the TikTok generation. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's what someone fucking commented about it. Here's the thing, and I, I'd be interested to know if you're the same. When I first started watching Fresh and Fit, Kevin Samuels, there's a part of me that I notice that gets satisfied by watching that. Like, yeah, yeah, you fucking, you take those thoughts down. You take those bitches down. I'm like, whoa, 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 where are you coming from? Like, what part of me is it that takes satisfaction from watching guys that are prepped shit on girls that have just come to come and sit in a podcast studio? It's the beta part. Like, the, the part of you that still remembers getting rejected from girls and everything. It's like, this is like us indulging in that thing of, Vindic oh, like, we're going to get the girls. some vengeance. Yeah, that's it. Because to imagine to how many guys that is so attractive to, because how many guys, okay, this, that's a part of us right now. If we're doing okay with the girls, it's like a part of us still remembers and like, you know, is, is hateful for the fact that we got rejected by this one girl or by hundreds of girls. Imagine how many guys are like literally not attracting any women whatsoever. All they have, it's not even a part, that is just them it's just hateful, resentful. And then they go onto a show where a girl's getting made fun of and, you know, the girl says something, but he's like, no, but uh, here's the fact. Like, here, you didn't you didn't research like we did. Like, that, that guy's going to feel like some kind of fulfillment from that. Like, yes, like, finally, like, they, they're getting put in their place. It is so attractive to the, the huge proportion of guys who have been hurt by women. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it feels like vindication. And it feels like catharsis as well. You have these these guys there that are, and I, I think that's one of the reasons why you get a particular type of very loyal following for them, mm. which is they almost feel like they're the best of us. You know, they're the tip of the spear that's delivering the words to the girls that righteously should have been shit on long ago. You know, if I went back and told that girl that snubbed me in the nightclub four years ago that I still remember because I haven't done any self-work or meditation or been to see a fucking therapist, which I definitely need. That's them saying to all of the girls that have ever rejected you, what you always wanted to say. Mm. So it feels nice. I, I can emphasize with the hundreds of thousands of young men who are actually watching this with a sense of enjoyment. Me too. Because they didn't get to ever say this stuff. But the thing is, like, be bitter or be better. And this is what they're choosing right now. There's no growth coming from this, but it is that sense of instant gratification, of pleasure, of just thinking, like, oh, yeah, like at least a part of you feels like that you know like fulfilled when you get a sense of like revenge against the person who hurt you yeah well one of the things as well i think you talk about this is that a lot of the uh, the content that i don't like that comes out of the manosphere red pill youtube space is the stuff that is predicated on shitting on women rather than raising up men 
mm. that 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 puts me in the least positive some mindset it puts me in the least grateful place it makes me feel anxious it makes me feel on edge it makes me feel it's like the difference between it's like that's my dopamine system as opposed to my serotonin system i don't feel mm. good i don't feel nice i don't feel connected i feel agitated and anxious and i get pleasure but i get pleasure with this sort of it's like it's like watching some like fucked up porn and then mm. afterwards feeling a little bit disgusted at yourself for what you've just watched and yeah it's not that when i watch that stuff it's not my highest like my highest self isn't coming through that's not adonis or les that's <laughs> that, that's jeffrey that's jeffrey it really is man and it, it's Oh, it, it, it's the problem with the internet, the new ones. Like it, are we, I could use this explanation for everything we talk about, but the internet is turning into like such a negative place because that's what sells, that's what we're clicking on. Seeing a girl get, get kicked out of the studio is a lot more attractive than like seeing the same guys talk about, like, oh, here's, here's 531. How, here's, how here's to increase your routine. credit like, score. Yeah. Yeah. Because, like, you know, this is, this is more valuable. But the thing is, <laughs> are we even looking for value anymore? Or are we just looking for like cheap entertainment? And so this is the one that sells. And the issue with this is like, there is a certain value with this, but it's a negative influence on your personality. And at least for me, when I, when I was fully consumed by this type of content, even before Fresh and Fit came out, it's, my personality was fucking trash. Like, I know, like a lot of guys say, like, you know, pers- I, I was like, I saw girls as like the enemy to conquer. And so it, it's the pickup artist age that a lot of guys go through. And I never saw them as like a person to like this this sounds blue pill to, to see how deep i've went into it where like i've got to even catch my, am i blue pill no like is he is he trying to convert me to blue pill is it i used to see girls as like not someone to like sort of build things like as on the same team they were almost the enemy even if we were doing good together i was always like wary of them i was always thinking yeah like i always thought like i had, I had to conquer them in like a very negative way Whereas recently, like I, I've taken a big step back from that therapy, as you said, meditation, journaling, reading books on dating, reading books on attachment styles. And I think the childhood stuff is like very, very important here. And I realize now it's like, I love being around women. Like I've made video clickbait videos. And again, it's that negative, like, um, you know, thing sells. I made videos saying like, I, I hate women and stuff, but it's to get the click and then I say, you know, different things on it. But it's like, I, I've actually started to love being around women and love having that feminine energy around me. And it's like the moment that you kind of like level things up with her feels it's such like a beautiful experience that I was always ignorant to because I was entirely focused on like the number clothes and the lay clothes. And when you're doing it as like a mathematician and you're thinking, okay, okay, I've got like a 3% success rate. So I've just got to go up to hundred girls. It's like, you're literally seeing them more as like a number than you are a human being who could be a compliment to your life. But dude, the red pill pickup, at least pickup was started by Aspergic and autistic guys that had no idea how to communicate to women. So the fact that there's a lot of sexual market value, peaks, graphs, fucking pictograms and scores out of 10. It doesn't surprise me because that's what a lot of the people that began this movement think in. You know, there were programmers, coders, nerds that couldn't get women. And there's this zero-sum mentality in the manosphere. I was listening to the Mating Grounds podcast. Have you heard of this? Okay, no. so Tucker Max, who is the, used to be the CEO of Scribe Media, created the fratire genre, wrote, I hope they serve beer in hell. Like, basically fucked girls and threw up in bathrooms for a decade and then wrote about it and created New York Times bestsellers, did a ton of psychotherapy and uh, psychedelics, and now has flipped the other way with Jeffrey Miller, who wrote The Mating Mind. He's one of the like premier evolutionary psychologists that focuses on mating dynamics. Um, and they did a podcast and it stopped eight years ago. So it is one of the best podcasts that you can go back and listen to. It's called Mating Grounds. It's so fucking dope a guy that's field tested and a guy that's got the academic chops to go with it, talking about the fundamentals of male, female attraction, dating dynamics. But they say, they're talking about pickup, but you see, and this is the fascinating thing. It's like eight years old, right? This episode that I listened to this morning. And it's the same fucking dynamics. It's not Neil Strauss and mystery and pickup and real social dynamics anymore. It's now fresh and fit and Kevin Samuels and Rolo Tomasi and Red Pill and Manosphere and Alpha and Beta and Black Pill and Blue. Like, that's the language. The language has changed, but the dynamics are exactly the same. And they're saying the entire pick apart this community sees any woman's gain as a man's loss and any man's gain as a woman's loss. 
So they see a very adversarial relationship. They go into a club and they talk about pick up, like you pick something up. It's an action that you do. They talk about game and banging. And it's all of these terms that if you break them down, it's all to do with a very aggressive zero sum mentality. Mm. But they're saying that if you bed a woman, it's almost her loss. That's the mentality that Pickup went into it with. And I think that you still see that now. It's this adversarial relationship as opposed to a positive sum mentality. I'm like, fuck, man. Like, I don't want to be a part of that at all. That's interesting. Do you feel like they might have like a hidden sense of self-awareness that they see? Okay, if the woman's losing out when if she's having sex with them, it's almost because they're aware of the fact that they aren't like good men. Yep. I think so. And I think as well that when you when you obsess so much over the dynamics, it takes you out of the moment. You know, like you can have you can critique women that go on all night stand uh, one night stands all you want, but you still want a one night stand as a young guy. So you're asking women to adhere to standards that you're not encouraging them to, to adhere to in your real life? Hang on. That there's something fucking going on there. You can't point a finger at women and say, you're a slut if you have a one night stand, then go out and use all of the tricks that you found from neuro-linguistic programming to pick up, to neg into all of that shit, to then get them into bed and then feel disgusted at the woman for having done it. It's like, fuck me. There is no positivity in that situation. Like every single step of the way is negative. And, you know, I think that there probably are some norms that we need to readdress around casual sex. I think that people probably do give away their bodies too quickly. And I think that recreating a sense of sacredness around uh, putting yourself inside of someone else's body is probably a pretty good thing to do. I think that would be generally good for society. But you still need to see like how fucking negative and degenerate most of this stuff is. 100% agreed. And that honestly, that was me. That was like, I was the judgmental guy. Okay, women should be, shouldn't be having casual sex, but it was, it was what I wanted. And so now I mock that sort of personality type using the Jeffrey character saying like, you know, women are all sluts, but why won't they be my slut? It's like, they don't actually hate women for being sluts. These aren't like philosophical men who understand the detriments of a society that engages in casual sex. These are just guys who are pissed off that they're not the ones women are having sex with. They're not, they don't like, it, it's easier for them to say, oh yeah, you know, because uh, women shouldn't have sex because it's bad for them. It's bad for society. It's easier for them to say that than it is to say like, yeah, they shouldn't, you know, they hopefully could just have sex with me, but they don't want to. So they shouldn't be having casual sex, but you're, you're absolutely right. And I think that's something literally is one of the biggest things in my mind right now is like the sacredness of sex and how to like reduce casual sex. So I'll be completely honest. Like I'm actually struggling with that. If there's a woman I'm attracted to and she seems to be back into me. There's been so many times where, you know, recently I've been thinking, okay, no more casual sex. I'm into like either relationships and love and everything, but I'm in bed just as fast as like that. It's like, and I can't tell if it's like an addiction or something, but I find it so hard to restrain myself from engaging in that. Well, remember that you're talking, you've got two systems that are running here, man. Like the one that says, I want to put my penis inside of that girl is a lot more subconscious and a lot more ancient than this one that says, remember Adonis, I need to focus in the morning. I need to make sure that I go and do my meditation. You know, that, that push and pull, if it wasn't the case that we were subject to our subconscious, we would never do anything that we didn't want to do. But all the time we do stuff that we don't want to do. We press the snooze button, even though we committed to ourselves that we weren't going to press the snooze button. We don't meditate. We forget to ring our mum. We do whatever it might be. Like All of these things are because there is something else going on. And sex is one of, you know, it's on the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It is one mm. of the fundamental elements. It's like saying, I told myself I was going to fast for a week, but I broke after two days. Like, that must be because I'm a bad person because I can't do the fast thing. It's like, n no, your biology is very, very geared towards you not starving in the same way as your biology is geared towards you if you have the opportunity to have attachment-free sex to do that. But again, over time, you know, this is how long have you been in this sort of mode? Six months, maybe one year? Yeah, about yeah. six months. Yeah. And how long had you spent idolizing women? Probably 10 years. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, well said. You know, say your, give yourself your advice from earlier on. Yeah. That's actually, I'm a, I very much appreciate you just saying that. Actually, just hit me with my own advice because it is hard, man. It's, I, I know the dangers of casual sex and I, I openly even speak against it on my channel because 
for for a while I, I branched away from it in the sense okay women shouldn't have I was in one of those guys women shouldn't have casual sex but you know for men well, men are different and high value men can do what yeah, shut up bro but now I realize like after speaking to another YouTuber Elliot Hulse and speaking about fatherlessness it, it's caused by both men and women engaging in casual sex that it's the issue it's like there is just a complete detriment to society when either one of us engages in that activity because it just leaves a generation of fatherless boys and then those fatherless boys are more likely to continue the same thing and it's, it's the hard times great strong men uh, paradigm that's happening has your camera just gone that's all right yeah. did you hear that yeah Beep. <laughs> so, I was, so again this jeffrey miller thing i was listening to earlier on i would add one book in that i'm only halfway through it's called mate and it's by jeffrey miller and tucker max and it's an evolutionary psychologist and a guy that's partied for a decade um, become the man women want and it's just it's like it's a bit of a cringe title but i guess it gets across what it is i think it'd be a really interesting read for girls as well to go through i think models by mark manson as well is really interesting for girls to see their own need that that neediness dynamic basically uh, mark says that one of the fundamental um dynamics that goes on between men and women is a level of neediness and that neediness from a man is fundamentally unattractive. And basically, that's what you need to avoid at all costs. One of the best ways to not be needy is to have a life that doesn't need anybody else in to make it fulfilled. You you are enough, and then somebody joins, and you make a life that is better together for both of you, as opposed to you are not enough, you're insufficient, and a girl comes in and fills the void, because then you're constantly going to be pining after that girl. And also, mm. it's, a, it's a weak position to negotiate from. But so in this, this is fucking eight years ago, man, right? Jeffrey Miller, who wrote The Mating Mind, which is like one of the foundations for pretty much everything else that grew out of it. Jeff Miller says that only 10% of the pickup and manosphere world understands his work. He reckons that more than 50% of his sales were to the manosphere. And even though they idolize Jeffrey, almost none of them understand his work. The entire point was to understand what women want, but no one focuses on it. Mm. So what, what is the, the summary that you've got from that, that work so far? Uh, it's a, a list of five different things and in there is tell the truth like one of the one of the things is to constantly tell the truth to build up self-esteem in yourself another one is to um not work with bias but to work with uh, rationality uh, i wonder what i'd be interested to find out where the rational male came from i wonder whether that was an influence on on rollo and what he did but it's not got this sort of very neggy very distasteful degenerate sort of zero sum mentality at all you you sent me this video of the future is polyamorous what do you reckon about the future of relationships can you see that happening yeah 100 percent. i watched that video and honestly it really opened up my my eyes after i watched your podcast with uh vincent, vincent. But, yeah. Adam, yeah um so you guys are discussing the sexual marketplace and how it's going to just get more and more cutthroat so i made like a one hour video in response where i was just kind of like just you know gurgitating ideas and just seeing what would happen and we're entering some dark times for young men. The fact that I think near the end of your podcast, you were really like started taking the back thinking of like the seriousness of this problem. Like, I don't think we, you know, we're just kind of chatting about you know, how to get girls and everything, but this is like, this is maybe one of the biggest problems. Ending. Yeah. This quite literally is like a 10 out of 10, like disaster just waiting to, like it's happening right now and everyone's not really taking it serious because it's just like, oh, you know, like guys just want to get laid, but it's a huge, huge problem. And the idea is, okay, what is going to happen in the future of dating? Well, relationships amongst young people and even sex is like, it's just going out of place. No one's really getting into like a monogamous, committed, long-term relationship. The people who are getting into monogamous relationships are often finding that their relationships end six to 12 months later and they end in like infidelity and everything. And the idea is that women just keep, you know, with hypergamous nature, they just keep wanting better and better and better, and better, better, better men. And because w the top men that all the women want are ruthlessly competitive, ruthlessly competitive, it's like this this section of men, let's say the top ten percent, is becoming ever harder to get into. Let's say fifty years ago, it was like he didn't stink and he had a car. And all the girls were after him. And now it's like, you need everything. You need like, you need six pack. You've been training for six years in the gym. You need like your, the mental, like confidence and the degree, postgraduate graduate degree. You need everything these days as a man to like be in this top 10%. It's just, it's just going to get more and more ruthless. Women want the men in here. The thing is, the men in here don't just want one woman. If you're the guy who's essentially beaten 90 something percent of other guys in terms of your characteristics, 
chances are like a lot of guys do say like you know oh no it's just like i just want one woman if you had the ability to to attract more than one woman i think the overwhelming majority of guys would actually accept that proposal and be with two women instead in like a, let's say in a dating market and i think we're going to see this more and more and i think alexander grace the youtuber who made that video of uh, polygamy being normal he had this fantastic point where he said that he thinks feminists are actually going to push this narrative not men because it's going to be like this sort of like new age fight for like more rights in the sense where like women would rather be women it's Rolo Tomasi's quote women would rather share an alpha than be saddled with a fateful beta if that's the case if the next frontier for feminism is opening up polyamorous relationships or it's polygynous relationships technically um if that's the next frontier for them i I don't think that the future looks very good for civilization because that is, if that's a cause that women start to campaign for, that's the sort of thing that men are going to riot and kill about. And there's such a cool study. I'd ne had you ever seen that graph before? The one where he'd, uh, what was that guy's name? The YouTuber? Alexander Grace. Yeah, um, where Alexander had found a graph that showed the relative number of men mm. versus the relative number of women that were giving birth to children. Presumably this must be genetic data somehow. And um, you can see that from about 50,000 years ago until 10,000 years ago, it's relatively equal. Like women are a little bit higher because on average uh, women are more successful at having children than men are. Women are a little bit higher, men are a little bit lower, but kind of tracking similarly. And then 10,000 years ago, the men just drop off a cliff go to basically zero it looks like like who who which men are having children here there's no there's no one and his argument was that during the agricultural revolution what you had was the ability for men to accrue status and resources which afforded them the ability to have huge harems of women that they could keep safe but then what they realized was that it was an incredibly unstable society for men to be in and i had an evolutionary biologist on the show joe henrik the other day and he said that a lot of uh, South Pacific islands and uncontacted tribes and stuff that have been studied, some of them have a, what's called a, it's like a gentriatric, I think, or a ger gerificic or something, uh, which is the old people are the ones that are in charge. Um, and men have to go through a number of rituals before they can marry. And often it keeps them until their thirties before they can do, you got to do this, got to do this, got to do this, got to do this. But what that, leaves you with is a ton of available women that are captured by a bunch of old men and then a shit ton of young men that are coming up that think well, i've got to do my next ritual in three years time i can't get a woman at the moment because they've all been captured by these guys and these stupid rituals and this ideology that we've got fuck it let's revolt and it's mm. just an inherently unstable society so that's the thing nobody wants that nobody wants that society when they actually look at it nobody wants the unstable sexless underclass of men roaming the streets shit like that's bad for absolutely everybody and i don't know i don't know if polygyny is as realistic as alexander makes out because modern notions of romanticism have skewed what women expect a lot and I think that it's not sufficient for women in a relationship to simply get their fair share of resources. They actually want to feel emotional connection and time with their partner. And if you end up having, you know, one man to three women or one man to four women, like is one quarter of that man's attention going to be enough for you? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. There's so many things to break down there, but the last point that you made um, in terms of the media influencing because that's that, that's huge the media very very heavily influences our day in and our sexual lives and it was a realization that i had let's say 50 years ago disney was a, a huge thing that pushed forward like the blue pill ideology and like the one itis belief you know like they got happily married like happily ever after what's very interesting is like that media is very very different like I don't consume much media, but I can almost like envision sort of like new age sitcoms and you know like reality TV shows where it's like 
the modern stuff of the day and we you're seeing it in the show you're gonna see this one girl who like oh she just had a dr drunken hookup with this guy who didn't text her back and like she wants this guy but this guy's got this other guy and maybe she'll go on a date and you know they had a threesome together or something you're beginning to see it because media influences us but we also influence like the media and of course some random show that shows these dynamics is going to be quite relatable amongst a certain audience so we are going to see like the, the I don't watch it personally, but like I know for a fact there's going to be some TV shows that are like doing really well right now, which will have quite a prominent character being a part of this like modern new age dating. Well, dude, think about what Love Island does. Love Island mm. turns, I'm fucking a part of this problem, right? I understand that it's the pot calling the kettle black. They turn dating into a game. Like it's, it, it is a game show first and foremost after everything after you've been through six weeks there's been vote offs there's been surprise additions there's been casa amor people have come in you've been worried about losing this partner it's been this really intense experience you've been you've got a wicked tan and at the very end you've won here's some celebrations oh wait now you get to play would i lie to you or deal or no deal or golden balls you get to do split or steal and i've always been really interested about why that was there and i asked the guys on my season like what was going on with that but what it tells us like it's the final thing that you see on the entire season you watch the whole season it's the f it's the fucking parentheses or it's the period at the end right the full stop is will you split or steal this 50,000 quid which is a pointless exercise now because the money that you make off yeah. the back of it if you've made it to the end and you've won is so much more and if you were to steal the amount of money that you would make from your Boohoo sponsorship would go through the floor because you wouldn't have as much brand equity anymore because you'd be the dick that stole 25 grand. Um, it just reminds everyone that it's a game. That's what it does. It's a show that is called Love Island that is ostensibly supposed to be about love. And at the end of it, it reminds everyone that actually it wasn't so much about the relationship. There was this game show element to it as well. That doesn't seem like a tremendously effective romantic way to teach young people about caring about their relationship everyone's swapping beds twice a week new guys come in oh i like it i know i'm with him but I'm, i like him or i know i'm with her but i'm gonna like what's what does Rolo call it uh branch swinging mm. yeah i'm gonna branch swing across this or i'll dip my toe in and see whatever's going on <laughs> fuck man that's so interesting a show called love island is heartless That's, that's like the modern dating that we're literally surrounding ourselves with. Of course, this is like to an extreme level and it's for the audience, the viewership and everything. But honestly, they're, they're not that far off normal dating lives anyway. A lot of it is recreating what people in, in like, let's say the young party casual sex scene are experiencing. Because otherwise, honestly, like if you're someone who's been like a bit of a fuck boy, go to clubs and everything, like, you know, that dynamic. That's why it's so re relatable and so fun to watch because the questions that you're asking people is like the questions that I'm asking some girl that I just met yesterday. And then it's like, oh, there's another guy. Is he going to mug me off of the girl and everything? Like, it's so realistic. But it just when you really think about the fact that it's, it's literally just like all over the place. Like this is modern dating is just kind of like the fast food version of the healthy version that we may have gotten to experience like a hundred years ago. Fuck. I don't know. And, but I also don't understand. Like, I agree. I think the one-itis thing disempowers people from bad relationships. You know, this is the part of Rolo's work that I think he really nailed, which is this myth of the one. There is not one person out there for you. There are a number of people that are uh, variably appropriate. And the goal is to find somebody that is as close to appropriate as possible. Now, that's not to say that you can't feel incredibly special and like you have a team and a community and this is what you're going to do. And especially once you have kids, you're like, okay, like this is with together through thick and thin here you know i don't want my kids to grow up in a single parent household and i'm going to do everything i can to make sure that that doesn't happen i don't know how you blend um love island transient transactional relationships with the myth of one itis with progression for uh women and men to not have rights removed from them and norms removed from them that restrict their premarital sex with the challenges in women raising up through the dominance hierarchy and there being few and fewer men hypergamously that are attracted to them. I'm like, all of this blended together just to me. Do you know what it is, man? It feels like fucking don't look up. 
which is the new Netflix show about an asteroid that's coming toward Earth. And these couple of researchers are screaming at the president of the United States and saying, this is going to come and this is going to kill us. We need to do something about it right now. And nobody listens. And they say, well, you say it's 99.9. Let's call it 70. We'll get a press release out. They're like, no, 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 no. Don't call it fucking 70. This is a big deal. This is a planet killer. And then it ends up being everybody gets destroyed. Yeah, I've tried to wrap my mind around the, the potential solution to all this, and I, I can't think of any good answers whatsoever. And I, the only one that comes to mind is things keep going the way that they are, and instead of the bottom 80% of sexless, intimacy, love-deprived men revolting, they all just get consumed by the metaverse, and that's their new reality, and they find a sense of like love. And, and I'm being deadly serious. I think that's actually the most realistic scenario is a few years from now we have like ultra realistic sort of like virtual reality and guys are just trading an hour of cuddling for like 0 0.1 ethereum and that's <laughs> that'll do them Dude, well, i mean you'll see this in your youtube comments i've definitely seen it in some of the red pill videos that i've done where guys will say the more mig tawi black pill guys will say um don't need to bother with women just wait for the sex robots and buy cars in the in the meantime and i'm thinking well i mean <laughs> it's a solution it's not, I, w I wouldn't say it's an optimal solution. It's not the one that I would choose. But I understand the compulsion of a guy who feels like he can't get physical intimacy or find a woman or a wife that cares about him. I understand why that would be attractive. And maybe you're right. Maybe the best, the second best option, if revolt is the worst option, maybe the second best option is sedation. If you sedate the populace with, enough metaverse and virtual reality and convenience to the point where mm. people genuinely men genuinely don't care about mating anymore but even that man like i can't imagine me being that guy i don't that's not the sort of life that i want and again i understand that not everybody has the same life experiences but fuck that like did you did you really want to grow up for this to be the pinnacle of your life to be honest, I feel like the sedation is already has been happening for many, many years. Video games, porn, social media. I think the majority of guys are so consumed in, in this technology that they wouldn't ever revolt. And life, life is like good enough for the majority of guys. And the things that they miss from real life, like a sense of brotherhood, status and recognition, they're getting in games like Call of Duty, the things that they miss in the date in a sexual market because they're not part of the, you know, the 20% of guys who are like allowed to get that stuff. They get from like, I don't know, TV shows and porn and just fantasies and sending dick pics on Instagram. So although it doesn't essentially fulfill the exact need, the thing is the businesses that, sedate a person and make them feel like somewhat like they've ticked off those bottom pillars of Maslow's hierarchy of needs those industries are like billions like hundreds of billions because that's that's where billions of men are going to and to be honest you were saying like you, you couldn't imagine a life like this that made me realize okay usually if i do see those men uh, those comments of like the men saying men going their own way and black pill you know usually i'm instantly like okay you loser like i don't know why you're doing that just you know focus on self-improvement and everything but lately i because of your podcast, I've been thinking more about this and I've been thinking, are men like you and I living our life through the lens of someone who isn't genetic, this sounds horrible, like genetically sort of subpar. And that's why we're saying things like, oh, you know, I wouldn't want to live that life, but it's like, we're tall, attractive guys. We've got like these good features and everything. We couldn't imagine a life like that, but what about for the guy? We couldn't imagine life like that, even if, you know, things were worse off because we'd be, okay, you know, let's, let's still get, get the six pack, get the money and everything. But what about the guy who's like literally five foot seven, unattractive face? You know what's weird? Did you watch, oh, again, you don't use a massive amount of social media, but Molly May, who won Love Island a couple of years ago, she trended on Twitter uh, this week because she made some pretty tone deaf comments about how people that are poor just need to work harder and they can do whatever they want. And someone mentioned that she works for Pretty Little Thing and gets £600,000 a year, but Pretty Little Thing pay their workers £3.50. So it's very difficult. It doesn't matter how hard I work, I'm stuck in a poverty trap. And it kind of feels maybe a little bit like that, that there is a degree of blindness to 
people for whom there is a ceiling on it, on their capacity for growth, personal agency, sovereignty. So the black pill uh, in incel forums, on average, it's 30% of people to 50% of people have some sort of autism spectrum disorder. So they're Aspergic, they're autistic, or they might be disabled physically. And you think, when you learn that stat, you're like, me telling you that you need to go read Atomic Habits by James Clear just doesn't cut the mustard. But I mean, frankly, I don't think that me or you are speaking to them. Like, that's not my audience. Bro, like, I feel for you, you know, there is a channel of interesting content for you here, but genuinely I feel like your situation requires more specialist assistance than I can give it. Um, this is for the, this is written for the me and you 10 years ago, right? That's what the content is created there for. And to pick out any, anything that you say is a generalization and to pick out that one example that doesn't fit the generalization, you're like, oh, okay, cool. I can't make a one size fits fucking everybody solution here. We're just trying to give across the best tactics that we found that work for us that will hopefully apply to the widest group of guys and girls. Mm. 30 to 50%, man. It's interesting what you said. Like, our, our content's not really calling out to them. For me, the reason why I do try to like help these guys and I make videos for the guys who are like, you know, total losers and everything is because I've been there and honestly, like I, I could have been an incel at this point and it's so interesting. Okay. Everyone would be completely, no, Hamza, you're six foot one, you've got the jawline, you know, genetics, like, like face and everything, but I could have been. And like, I, honestly, I wasn't that far off at that point to be black pilled and everything. If I stumbled down onto like the black pill subreddit, if there was one at the time, you know, if I started engaging in that type of content, I probably would have been one of these guys saying like, no, it's over for me because I'm brown skin and everything. And in fact, that was like one of the beliefs I, I genuinely thought I was like ugly because I was brown skin and no girls wanted me. And then it just something just hit me. I think I started weightlifting at first and, you know, you envision the body. And I just thought, wait, hang on. If I've got like a 10 out of 10 body, I'm still brown, bro. Like I'm still going to be attractive. Like there's, there's definitely brown guys who are like getting girls right now. So it isn't the fact that I'm brown that I'm not you know, getting the success that I want. But I don't think we're relatable, like, at all to a large chunk of men. And I think a, a big part of that was obviously their characteristics. They're, they say, you know, like, negative Canville till. They've got some good terms What's for this. What's that? Like hun hunter eyes and prey eyes. So you've got, so hunter eyes is like, where your eyes are like um, almond shaped and okay. it quite close to your eye this is autistic like quite close to your eyebrows and it makes you look like a hunter in the sense of like you know a wolf has like those eyes okay and then prey eyes are like circular like i've got prey eyes which are like <laughs> that's what they always say they make videos about me so like hubs has got prey eyes and stuff it's like they say like <laughs> he's got a good jawline he's six foot one he's attractive and everything but his eye region lets him down like they, they his eye like, region. <laughs> it's going to do it hurts man like it's not wearing glasses and stuff now but it's like prey eyes are more like circular eyes like you know like rabbit eyes so you okay. can see more of a scope around around you but you know what's a very interesting there is an up and coming black pill youtuber called wheat waffles and he, he was like um like treading the path for the black pill content just a few months ago i got him onto a podcast and we argue a lot and everything we're disagreeing with each other and it was like a very very bad sort of episode and everything but then we speak more and more we literally become friends and then for the second episode a lot of people realize like he's kind of changed his mindset on a fair amount of things and just out of nowhere obviously he was arguing things like no hamza what you're teaching is like a scam and um, getting fit getting the muscular body doesn't work and everything that was on the first episode on the second one he, he just randomly says yeah like the most important thing you can do is build the muscular body i was like wait that's like that's red pill as fuck that's and he went like he's changed his mind and he he it, this is these guys are like you know like you said um very math like they're into math and data and all this so he's done like a face analysis of a thousand people quantified it got the graphs and everything like this autistic oh, level stuff the highest thing like the best thing that a man can do to improve how attractive he is to a woman and he quantified so many different things is loose fat build, build muscle everything else was way less than that surgery and height and all this stuff but loose fat build muscle he said that Pretty much every guy should at least try to do this, at least try to build that body first and then find out if you like should be black pilled. And even though that advice is a bit like, uh, like I, I kind of agree. 
That's what I've been saying to a lot of guys. Before you take the black pill, before you want to be an incel, try to build a 10 out of 10. Do 5-3-1 like, for 18 one. months. Buy Bitcoin. <laughs> Buy Bitcoin. Do 5-3-1. Buy Bitcoin. Do 5-3-1. At um, least build like the 6 out of 10, 10 out of 10 body, and then just see how you feel after that. If after that you say, okay, still no attraction from women whatsoever, bro, I'll cry with you. But I can't imagine there's a guy who's got like the full aesthetic body and the, like the low body fat percentage that comes with it, who still says that he completely struggles with women and that it hasn't gotten better at all. And if even if there's a small majority of men who say it hasn't got better at all, I guarantee those guys would still not stop lifting because it's just become like a part of their identity and they really it's like a win-win it's just scenario. a positive thing. Yeah. So you talk about we've mentioned on the channel before about how on Tinder there is the bottom eighty percent of men competing for the bottom twenty percent of women, top eighty percent of women competing for the top twenty percent of men. The inference from that is if you're not physically in the top, if you're not an eight out of ten relative or above as a guy, then you are by definition, in the bottom part. Now, one of the things that I think guys, especially the young guys that are listening, need to know is that on average, your competition for guys that are developing themselves is so piss poor that you don't actually need to be in the 80th percentile of anything. You only need to be slightly better than the massive amount of guys that are not doing anything at all. This is like about guys that are going to the gym if you go to the gym three times a week, you're in probably the top 1% or 5% of fit people on the planet. Like, and especially in a Western country like America or the UK, that I think on average, everybody's overweight in both hmm. countries. 70%. Like, yeah, on average, you're obese. The bar is set so fucking low for you to be a guy that goes to the gym that listens to some charisma on command stuff that takes a little bit from a podcast. You don't need to spend a ton of money. You don't need to what you don't even need to work that fucking hard. Like you do not need to work that hard. The bar is set so low for charisma, for confidence, for looks, for everything, because it's not about becoming an eight out of 10 compared with the people on Instagram. It's like that story about if you're in a wood and you're worried about being chased down by a bear, you don't need to be faster than the bear. You just need to be faster than the fucking guy next to you. I, honestly i love this thinking like i made it, one of my favorite random videos that i made was just titled your competition and i was trying to tell the boys you've got to stop thinking that you need to be like up here like a lot of guys will be on the defeatist mindset they'll be oh but like you know I'm, I'm not gonna go make 200k a year and like six foot seven and like all this like you don't need to be that good of course like it helps but that'd be nice but the thing is your competition right now for the average guy who's watching this who jacks off five times a week and he plays video games for like one hour a day but it's more like four the thing is if you do a push-up today, you have literally beaten 500 million men. How can that not blow your mind? And if you go and do like a good structured program, you're beating pretty much every single guy apart from like the five guys at your gym who are actually on a program themselves. You do that for three years, four years, whilst also like working on your career or business. And you've got some like fantastic traits. And not only that, but you put like, you're just happy. Like, okay, let's even forget about women. Like you built a body that you're proud of. You feel like, you know, you like do pain some respect disease and you feel shredded and everything. And now you've built some money so you can actually go and enjoy some experiences. If you forget about women for any sense at all, your life just got an infinitely better just by slightly thinking of your competition of the men around you. And I wish more guys could just realize that you're not in, co like you are absolutely somewhat, we're all in competition together. But the thing is, you, the way I explain it is like, we're all in competition, but we're in separate races. And if you're just starting off, you're in the race of Jeffries. And those guys, they're not even, they're running in the wrong direction. They're like, just doing some like weird shit. Like they're running the wrong race. All you've got to do is beat Jeffrey today. And then, okay, beat all the guys who beat Jeffrey yesterday. It's just a progressive overload in all sense of your life. Dope, man. We made it. Hamza, ladies and gentlemen, people want to check out your channel. Where should they go? Just search Hamza on YouTube. It'll be the first. That's a flex. It'll be, it'll be the first one that pops up. <laughs> Boss, have you got your plaque? Have you got your silver plaque yet? Oh, man. I've put in the details and everything. They take a while on the delivery, but we're on like 220k now. Flying, man. Look, dude, I've really enjoyed speaking to you. I think your content's dope. Keep at it. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for having me, man. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.